Hello everyone, and welcome to our online service. It's our hope that over the next 45 minutes or so, that you'll learn something new, you'll be inspired, and you'll connect with God in a meaningful way, wherever you're watching. For those of you who watch our online services regularly, you might be wondering, who's this guy? And who's that dog? My name is Jared Willey, and I serve here at Grace Chapel in the area of marketing and communications. And this is my dog, Gus. He's just along for the ride today. If you'd like to learn a little bit more about how to get connected to our church, feel free to pause the video and take a moment to click the link in the description to our online connection card. We'd love to hear from you. You'll find other links in there for our Instagram, Twitter, and our app as well. And of course, don't forget to hit the subscribe button here on YouTube. When you hear the phrase, community engagement, what comes to mind? Here's a hint. It's not a whole bunch of people all accepting wedding proposals at the same time. Community engagement simply means embracing and acting on the idea that we're all in this together. Not just those of us in church today, but all of us. We're all part of our surrounding neighborhoods, towns, and cities. One of the important things we learned from Pastor John's message last Sunday is that as Christians, we're not just called to tell people about Jesus with our words, we're called to show people Jesus through our actions. We do this by serving those in need around us in tangible, meaningful ways. Each Grace Chapel campus has partnered with one or more local organizations doing great work in their local area, providing support through awareness and volunteering. And you are invited to get involved. If you're in the Eastern Massachusetts or greater Boston area, a great way to serve is through one of our mission partners, the Boston Project. This grassroots organization is revitalizing a community in the Dorchester area of Boston through youth development programs, green space projects, public art, and building strong neighbor leaders. The link to Boston Project's website is in the video description. If you're local to the Boston area and enjoy live music, we've got an event this Friday night that you are going to love. It's called Originals. Every Sunday, our talented worship team brings us incredible music, and they've all come together to write a number of original songs that they'll be performing for the first time. The concert is this Friday night at 7 p.m. at our Wilmington location, and details are at grace.org slash events. Now, can I take a moment to get a little personal? Some of you are watching this service online because you just couldn't make it to in-person church today. And that's great. We're so glad you're connecting here. But some of you are, well, kind of keeping church at arm's length these days. We want you to know we understand. Whatever your past church or religious experiences were like, you're here because you want to keep growing spiritually. You're not ready to walk away, but maybe you're in a time of deconstructing or wrestling with your faith. We recently started a new in-person service for people just like you. It's called The Gathering, and it meets at our Wilmington campus the first three Sundays of each month at 5 p.m. If you'd like to learn more about it, visit grace.org slash gathering. That's it for news and announcements, so let's continue our service with a moment of prayer. I'll pause with a brief time of silence, which you can use to pray on your own or simply quiet your heart and mind, and then I'll close us. Lord God, thank you for this time to stop and turn our attention to you. I thank you for each and every person watching, wherever they are and ask that you'd meet them in this time. Our life experiences and faith stories are as unique as our fingerprints, yet we all share one thing in common. We were created to live a life in relationship with you. As we open our hearts and our minds, we ask that you'd fill them with your wisdom and equip us to do more good in the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Circumstance, the joy that I have is 
is my inheritance joy this is a joy of the lord the joy the joy the joy of the lord is my strength the joy the joy the joy of the lord is my strength Say 
Well, hey friends, happy to be back with you after a couple of Sundays away and happy to jump back into week four of our summer series as we seek wisdom from the book of James. Let's begin today with a little Shakespeare. Uh, in act four of his play, The Merchant of Venice, uh, Shakespeare takes us into a courtroom where a moneylender named Shylock is demanding that his debtor, Antonio, make good on their agreement. It seems that Shylock lent money to Antonio, his enemy, on the condition that if he couldn't repay, Shylock would be entitled to a pound of Antonio's flesh, cut from a place nearest his heart. But when Antonio is unable to pay the financial debt, Shylock asks the court to enforce the judgment that was previously agreed upon. A woman named Portia, disguised as a legal expert, enters the deliberation. And citing the unusual terms of the agreement, she urges Shylock to show mercy. And when Shylock asks why he should, Portia responds, The quality of mercy is not strained. It droppeth as the gentle rain from heaven on the place beneath. It is twice blessed. It blesseth him that gives and him that takes. It is enthroned in the hearts of kings. It is an attribute to God himself. Those are some of Shakespeare's most familiar lines, but you may not have thought of them since high school English class. Mercy can be defined as the kind and compassionate treatment of a person under one's power. It describes a disposition to be kind and forgiving, especially when you have reason not to be kind and forgiving. When one Little League team is clobbering another Little League team and they get ahead by 10 runs, the winning coach agrees to call it a game. That's mercy. In fact, that's what they call it, the mercy rule. When you forget to do your homework and your teacher lets you turn it in the next day with no penalty, that's mercy. When a police officer catches you breaking the speed limit and decides to let you off with a warning, that's mercy. Not that I would know anything about that. Mercy is a wonderful quality. And as Shakespeare reminds us, it's an attribute of God himself. And as James is going to show us today, it's essential to a faith that's deep and wise. Unfortunately, mercy doesn't always come easily to human beings, even to human beings who claim to be speaking and acting for God. So mercy is where we're going to end up today, but it's going to take a bit of a journey to get there, a journey that may get uncomfortable at points. So let's turn again to the New Testament book that we call James, the source of godly, practical wisdom for the challenging times we're living in. And so far, we've learned that, that wisdom is skill for living and that God gladly grants that wisdom to those who seek it. Two weeks ago, Pastor David helped us find the wisdom of persevering in hard times. And last week, Pastor John showed us the wisdom of doing God's word and not just hearing it. Well, today we're going to discover wisdom for human relationships, especially relationships with people who are different from us or who disagree with us. And even though I have studied and taught this passage many times over the years, I found it especially relevant and convicting this time around. 
We're going to be looking at James chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. There are three movements to the passage. Uh, in the first movement, James raises the, James raises the problem of favoritism. In the second movement, he tells us why favoritism is so wrong. And in the third movement, James offers us a better way. So let's begin with the problem of favoritism. Chapter 2 begins, My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. Well, a couple of weeks ago, we pointed out James' pragmatic, no-nonsense style. He doesn't waste time with niceties or small talk. So when he begins this section with the words, my brothers and sisters, it kind of catches us by surprise. I mean, for James, that's downright mushy. But, but James hasn't suddenly gone soft on us. He begins the section that way on purpose. He's reminding his readers that they are all equally valued members of God's family. And that's going to be important to his argument as he goes. So what does he mean by favoritism? And why is he bringing it up in this letter? Well, favoritism is simply partiality. It's treating some people better or worse than others, usually on the basis of some arbitrary or external criteria. It, it's similar to what we might call discrimination, but it's a bit more subtle than that, making it maybe even more insidious. A more literal translation might be, don't hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ with respect to persons. In other words, don't claim to be a follower of Jesus and at the same time treat some people better or worse than others. Now, that seems like it, it ought to be obvious, but apparently it was a real problem for the believers James was writing to. Let's, let's keep reading. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet, have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? So, so James offers a hypothetical example of what he's talking about. But you get the sense that this kind of thing was really happening in the churches. He describes a group of believers gathered for worship when a rich man walks in. He, he's obviously rich because of the way he's dressed. He's got a gold ring on his finger, for one thing. Now, in Roman society, rings were considered a sign of wealth the way uh, designer labels or a luxury car might be a symbol of wealth in our culture. They even had shops in Rome where you could rent rings for a party or special occasion to give the appearance of wealth. But the particular word that James use, he uses here is literally translated gold-fingered, which, which suggests that this guy didn't just have one ring, he had a fistful of he was also wearing fine clothes. And again, our, our translation doesn't quite capture the, the imagery here. His clothes were white, brilliantly white. And in the ancient world, white was the old black, uh, the color of style and class. If your clothes were white, it meant you didn't have to work for a living, or you could at least afford a, a set of dress clothes. Well, at the same time, James says, a poorly dressed man, uh, maybe even a street person, shows up. In fact, they, they both step into the lobby at the same time. And in James' imaginary scenario, uh, the, the ushers rush over to the nicely dressed man, offering him a cup of coffee, uh, escorting him to a choice seat halfway down on the aisle, uh, introducing him to one of the pastors on the way in. Meanwhile, the poorly dressed man stands alone in the lobby, trying to figure out where to go next. And as he tentatively makes his way toward the, toward the center door, an usher intercepts him with the security guy watching closely and, and ushers him to a bench in the lobby, suggesting that he watch through the open door. Have you not discriminated among yourselves 
and become judges with evil thoughts? James asks. Now, uh, we like to think that something like that would never happen here. And it probably wouldn't, at least not like that. I mean, churches like ours have come a long way over the years in creating a welcoming environment for all kinds of people. Uh, we don't have dress codes anymore. We have greeters at the door welcoming every person with a smile. Uh, we make sure we have different age groups and genders and ethnicities represented in our photos and, and on our platform. We try to avoid churchy insider kind of language. But as I was wrestling with this passage, and what it means for the church today in America in 2022, a few other words came to mind that are closely related to what James is getting at with the word favoritism. And the first word that came to my mind is bias. Now, bias can be defined as conscious or unconscious prejudice about an individual or a group based on their identity. It's to value someone more or less simply because of their gender or their age or their ethnicity or their marital status or their orientation or their belief system or their political affiliation. And generally speaking, we tend to be biased toward people who are like us and against those who are different from us. Now, now, most of us are polite enough never to let our biases show by, by offering someone a better seat or not smiling at them as they walk in the front door. But these biases can show up in more subtle ways by who we gravitate toward in the lobby after services or, or who we invite to be part of our small group or who we ask to serve on leadership teams or whose opinion we seek out when we're making a decision, or what type of worship environment we create, or what illustrations or applications we make in sermons. And since bias is often unconscious, we usually aren't even aware we are thinking or acting this way. But I can tell you, from, from years of being in the lobby after services, People tend to drift toward and engage with people who are like them or who they already feel comfortable with, while newer people or people who might look or dress a bit differently are often left standing by themselves, waiting and wondering if anyone will engage with them. I can also tell you that as a white, older male leader and preacher, I have often failed to, to consider the variety of people or perspectives in any given situation, assuming that everyone experiences the world or the church the way I do. That's bias. Now, here's a simple, very non-scientific test. Uh, listen, as I mention various groups of people and pay attention to what's happening inside you as I mention them. White people, black people, brown people, Asian American people, LGBTQ people, pro-choice people, pro-life people, Republicans, Democrats, evangelicals, Vaxxers, anti-vaxxers, conspiracy theorists, Yankee fans. <laughs> Those visceral reactions you felt for or against certain groups, that's bias. And if you can honestly say that you felt exactly the same toward every group I mentioned, that you are free to change channels, find another sermon to listen to today. Now, bias is primarily an internal belief or a disposition. When that bias gets translated into action, 
on a personal or structural level. It requires other words that come to mind here. Words like racism, or sexism, or ageism, or classism. And in recent years, there's been a painful but necessary reckoning with those realities in society and in the church. And while none of us like to think that those words might be used to describe us, I've had to acknowledge that I have not always exercised my power and influence in ways that are equitable for all the people we're trying to serve. Which is why I found James' wisdom on this subject so relevant and so convicting this time around. So James begins this section of the letter by naming the problem of favoritism, especially when it rears its ugly head in the church. But why is this such a big deal? Why does James devote, James devote so much time to the issue? And why have churches like ours addressed bias and racism more often in recent years? Well, James is going to offer three reasons <clears throat> why favoritism is so wrong. And the first problem with favoritism is that it misses the heart of God. It misses the heart of God. One of the most consistent themes of Scripture, from Old Testament to New, is that God cares for all people everywhere, no matter what their circumstances or the condition of their heart. Now, James' readers would have been very familiar with these words from the Torah. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality. So this text is clearly emphasizing the universality of God's reign, but also the uniformity of God's regard for all people. Every person matters to God. So much so, James tells us, that that God takes an active interest in those who seem not to matter as much as other people. The overlooked, the marginalized, the under-resourced. Look with me at verse 2. Listen, my dear brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. Now, as we pointed out a couple of weeks ago, all through his letter, James is echoing the words of Jesus, and often, in particular, the Sermon on the Mount. And that's the case here. I remember in that sermon, Jesus says, Blessed are the poor. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the persecuted. It's not that God loves these kinds of people more. It's just that God's heart goes out to them because they are at such a disadvantage materially and socially. In fact, if you go back and look at that reference from the Torah that we read a few moments ago that affirms God's impartiality, the text goes on to say, He defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow and the foreigner living among you, giving them food and clothing. So when we fail to recognize and address these inequities in society in the church, and when we consciously or unconsciously contribute to them by favoring certain people because of their wealth or position or similarity to us, we miss God's heart. Uh, from time to time recently, I've had people ask me, why we've talked so much about racism and justice in recent years. And there are a couple of reasons. Uh, for one thing, it's, it's been an important and complicated cultural conversation the past few years. And, and we feel a pastoral responsibility to, to hear from those who are hurting and, and to find some biblical perspective on these issues. Secondly, and maybe more importantly, we're realizing that we have missed how central these concerns are to the heart of God and the work of the church. I, I preached on this very text about 15 years ago here at Grace, and, and I'm actually using a very similar outline today. 
But as I reviewed that sermon, I was struck by how little I said about race and justice in that message, as if it wasn't a problem in 2006. So it's a helpful and needed correction for the contemporary church. And when we show favoritism to certain types of people or neglect to seek justice for the marginalized and vulnerable, we are missing the heart of God. Secondly, James tells us favoritism is wrong because it's a flawed strategy. And what I mean by that is it, it doesn't serve God's purposes. Uh, the Christians that James was writing to were at a disadvantage in their culture. I mean, ethnic, ethnically, many of them were, were Jews, so they were not part of the majority Greco-Roman culture. Socially, they were foreigners, immigrants, often treated like outsiders. And economically, they tended to be stuck in the lower strata of society. So when wealthy or powerful people showed up in their assemblies, they tripped over each other, showing preferential treatment towards them in hopes that they might gain some financial or social advantage for themselves or for the Jesus movement. The way we might react if, if Jason Tatum or Michelle Wu or Robert Kraft walked into one of our services. But it was a flawed strategy. James reminds them that the people they are trying to curry favor with are the very ones who are making life difficult for them and who have shown no interest in the gospel message. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you, James says? Are they not the ones dragging you into court? Are they not the ones slandering the noble name of him to whom you belong? And, and we make a similar mistake when, whenever we try to advance a heavenly kingdom by worldly powers and methods. Uh, back in college, I, I worked with a, a parachurch youth ministry, trying to reach kids who were far from God and church. We were trying to get a Christian club going in a local high school. And, and, and our leader's explicit strategy was to go after the winners, as he called them. The jocks, the cheerleaders, the class officers, the upper class juniors and seniors. But after knocking ourselves out all fall trying to win the winners over, we didn't have very much to show for it. But meanwhile, along the way, we had accumulated a pretty good crowd of freshmen and sophomores, most of whom were a few rungs lower on the high school food chain for a variety of reasons. So at a certain point, we decided to lean in to the kids we had. And with a little bit of investment in them, the club took off. We started packing out people's basements for meetings. And within a couple of years, we'd made a real impact on that whole school. That's always been God's strategy, to choose lowly things and unlikely people to advance his kingdom. Anytime we hitch our kingdom wagon to worldly powers, to wealth or celebrity or political entities, it is a flawed strategy that in the end will not accomplish the purposes of God. Uh, for years, the church growth experts pushed what they call the homogeneous principle, which is that churches grow faster when they focus on one cultural or generational demographic. And from a strictly numerical perspective, it actually works. But God's vision for his church is intergenerational and multicultural, a place where many become one and where we have unity with diversity. So I, I get dismayed these days when I see believers taking shelter in, in friendship circles or churches made up of people who think and live just like they do. They're not only missing God's heart, they're short-circuiting a greater work God might want to do in their hearts and in their community. So bias of any kind, racial, gender, age, has to be confronted and corrected, even when it's challenging and uncomfortable. 
So favoritism misses the heart of God. It's a, it's a flawed strategy. And thirdly, it reveals our brokenness. Look at verses 8 and 9. If you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. Showing favoritism or bias of any kind isn't just unfortunate and misguided. It's downright sinful. It reveals just how far short we have fallen of God's vision for human relationships. Now, James uses an interesting expression here when he refers to the royal law. It's the only time we find the law described that way in the Bible. He's reminding us that loving your neighbor as yourself is the royal law because it was set forth by our King, Christ himself, as the ultimate and supreme expression of God's will for humankind, how things work in his kingdom. So James is warning his readers, don't be fooled into thinking you're okay with God just because you haven't broken one of the big 10, murder or adultery or theft. Every time we value one person over another for any arbitrary reason, every time we give preferential treatment to someone because it's to our advantage to do so, every time we consider ourselves more important to God because of our race or religion or behavior, every time we pass judgment on someone because they think differently, or vote differently, or worship differently than we do. We have broken the royal law of the kingdom and distanced ourselves from God and other people. Now, we could get into a long discussion here about whether or not we are all racists, or sexists, or ageists, or whatever. And in my experience, those, those conversations are rarely very productive. But there's no escaping the fact that we are all biased. Surveys and studies have shown again and again that human beings prefer people who are like them and are suspicious of people who are different from them. Now, there are probably protective instincts behind such bias, but it inevitably leads to division and discrimination and oppression none of which has any place in God's kingdom, which is why these are things we need to name and repent of, why we've had to speak into them so often in recent years. Well, thankfully, James doesn't leave us here. Have, having warned us against favoritism and shown us why it's wrong, he now offers us a better way, a Christ-like way to respond to people who are different from us, who disagree with us, or who have disappointed us. It's the way of mercy. And he describes it in verses 12 and 13. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom, because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Do you see what James has done here? In a handful of verses, he has taken us from, from the judge's bench, deciding who's worthy of our time and attention, to the defendant's docket, guilty as charged with favoritism. We have broken the royal law of the kingdom of God many times over. And yet God, in his mercy, loves us anyway. He's reached out to us. He's come near to us, been patient with us, paid our debt, forgiven our failures, and made us full-fledged members of his eternal kingdom. And all he asks is that we be as merciful to others as he has been to us. Speak and act. James says, as those who have been shown mercy. And the particular verb forms that James used here suggest that, that this speaking and acting 
is to be an ongoing practice, a way of life. Make it a habit of your life, he's saying, to treat every single person as if they really matter to God and to you. So what does that mean for us here at Grace Chapel in 2022? Well, it, it means that we will value every single person who walks through the doors of our building or visits us online, no matter who they are, where they come from, or what they believe. It means we will welcome people just as they are. They don't have to meet any criteria to worship with us and to participate in the life of the community. It means in our church and in our groups, we will make room for all kinds of people. We won't assume that everyone in the group thinks or votes like we do. And we won't judge or challenge people who don't think or vote like we do. It means we will go out of our way to reach out to people who are not like us and who are most likely to feel left out or marginalized. And it means that when push comes to shove, mercy rules. When we have to choose between being right and being love, as Pastor John put it last week, we will choose love. When we have to choose between our rights and another person's need, we'll choose their needs. When we have to choose between canceling a person we disagree with or being kind to a person we disagree with, we'll choose kindness. And when we have to choose between the world's way of accomplishing something and Jesus' way of accomplishing something, we'll choose the way of Jesus. Because in Jesus' kingdom, mercy rules. Now, friends, are, are we hearing that? And more importantly, are we doing that? I'm not always so sure. Because I've been hearing these words in the church my whole life. In fact, I have preached these words, mercy triumphs over judgment. But do we speak and act like people who really believe that? When we disagree with someone over theology or politics or lifestyle, are we prepared to let mercy rule that relationship? And when we see division and discrimination putting people God loves at a disadvantage? Are we prepared to speak and act in ways that put things right, even when it means sacrificing some of our own rights? What a unique place the church could be. What a blessing Jesus' followers could be if we consistently let mercy triumph over judgment. Now, I I don't know how familiar Shakespeare was with the book of James, but he takes us to a very similar place in Portia's plea to the moneylender Shylock, who has a legal right to that pound of Antonio's flesh. The quality of mercy is not strained, she says, and earthly power doth then show likest gods when mercy seasons justice. Therefore, though justice be thy plea, consider this, that in the course of justice, none of us should see salvation. We do pray for mercy, and that same prayer doth teach us also to render the deeds of mercy. James and Shakespeare are both reminding us that we'll never be able to show mercy to others until we have first fully received mercy from God for the first time or the hundredth time. So let our first response to James' wisdom for today be to seek and receive mercy from God and from one another for all the ways we have shown favoritism and contributed consciously or unconsciously to a culture in which some people seem to matter more than other people. Lord, have mercy. And let our second response be to put our faith into action 
by being as merciful to others as God has been to us. Because when mercy rules, the kingdom comes. It comes to our hearts and our homes and our church and our world. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you today as people in need of mercy. We have failed far too often to love our neighbors as ourselves, especially our neighbors who are different from us, who've disappointed us or disagreed with us. We have fallen far short of your glorious vision for our lives and community. So we ask for and receive your mercy today offered to us through faith in your Son, Jesus Christ. And we pray that that same faith in Christ might inspire and empower us to speak and act with mercy in a world that desperately needs it. In Jesus' name, amen.
Thank you, Pastor Brian and our worship team for providing a beautiful service. And thank you for watching. A quick reminder that links to everything we mentioned are in the description. And even though today's message was all about mercy, have no mercy on that subscribe button. Go ahead and smash it. Go in peace, friends. Until next time.